Good morning again. The beginning of the book of Bereshis. Bereshis Boro Elohim. We're going to interpret this the way Rashi interprets it. In the beginning of God's creation, Es HaShamayim of the heavens, V'Es HaOretz and the earth. So as Rashi says, and he goes on in two, and the earth was null and void. So God said, let there be, and that is the narrative of creation. But first we come to the first Rashi, Bereshis. Omar Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak teaches, Rabbi Yitzchak was a scholar in the oral law, but the Rebbe explained that as it happens to be, Rashi's father's name was also Yitzchak. Rashi stands for Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. So Rashi is giving a tribute to his father by beginning his commentary on Chumash, quoting a man who shared his father's name. Omar Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak said, One would argue that the Torah, being a book of law, should begin with the first law. What is the first law? The first law is, and this month is to you, a month of beginnings, which God gave to the Jewish people in Egypt, shortly before their liberation. Shehi mitzvah rishona rosh chodesh. That was the first mitzvah. Shehnitztavu ba Yisrael, which the Jewish people collectively, as a people, were given. That's where the Torah should begin, I would think. Ma Tam, what is the reason then, Posach, that the Torah begins its narrative with Bereshis, with creation? The Torah is not a history book. The Rebbe often said, those who believe the Torah is a history book are wrong, because it's a very incomplete history book. Torah, Milashon, Hora'a. The word Torah comes from the word teaching. Everything in Torah teaches us something. If the history is not there to teach us something, it's not in the Chumash. So why then would we spend one and a quarter of the five books of Moses on history, telling about us about creation and Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph? I mean, who cares? Start with law. <clears throat> this must be instructive. Says Rashi, of course it is. And as the Rebbe points out, that we, as we study this, have to remember what year Rashi was writing this and where he was. Rashi couldn't get on an LL flight and go to Israel. Rashi was in France many years ago. Mishum, because Koach Masov Higid Liamei. <clears throat> 11th century, 12th century, because as the Tehillim puts it, King David, quoting from chapter 111, the power of his works he declares to his people, giving them the heritage of the nations. The declaration here is that Israel belongs to the Jewish people. If there will come a time that the nations of the world will say to Israel, to the Jewish people, you're thieves, you're robbers. You're occupiers. You have forcibly seized and occupied the land of the seven Canaanite nations. What right do you, Israel, have to occupy the land where there were Canaanite nations living and not bothering anybody? Well, not exactly. They were bothering everybody. But that's beside the point. Haim Aimrim Lohem. So Rashi tells us in the 11th, 12th century that the Jewish people, the children of Israel, say to the world, get up and say to the UN, the entire 
world belongs to God. How do we know? Because Bracious bought Elohim, who brought God created it. Unisono, and then he gave it Lasher Yosher Be'enov to whoever he felt like giving it to. And as we look, who did God give Israel to? Very important tidbit of history that many people don't know. That after the flood, there were three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Israel was given to Shem. The Canaanites come from Ham. The Canaanites came with guns and forcibly took it away from the Shemites. But in any event, God gave it, it went to whoever God wanted it to go. It ended up with the Canaanite kings. Yes, with his will, he delivered it into their hands. Then there came a time, as he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for years. He took it from them and gave it to us. That's why we need one and a quarter of the five books of Moses to tell us there was creation and there was Noah and there were three sons and there was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Egypt. And then when we get to the end of the five books of Moses, a couple days later, Yeshua is about to take the children of Israel across the Jordan to displace the Canaanite kings, finally, because this is God's plan. So the Jews should never hesitate to stand up before all the nations of the world and declare Israel was given by God, the Creator, to the Jewish people eternally. Anyone who says that any part of Israel belongs to them simply does not study Torah and does not know the teachings of Judaism. That's the famous first Rashi. Second Rashi. Rashi wants to know why the Torah chooses the word Bereshis to be the first word of the Torah. There are so many other ways of documenting creation. Bereshis boro ein hamikra hazeh emer. This verse literally shouts at us and says, Darsheni, interpret me. As our rabbis interpreted this, that Bereshis, the word Bez has the numerical value of two. Bereshis is beginning for two beginnings, for two because of two items, which the Torah refers to as beginnings. That's why God created the world. Bishvil HaTorah, because of the Torah, Shenikreis, which is called Reishis Darke, the beginning of God's way. The Torah is called beginning. O Bishvil Yisrael, and for the sake of the Jewish people. Shenikru, who are referred to in Jeremiah as Reishis Tvuosai, the beginning of God's produce. So that God created the entire universe so that the Jew can keep Torah and bring the light of Torah to the world. That's why there's an entire creation. And that's why Torah teaches us that in fact, earth is the center of the universe and Israel is the center of the earth and the entire creation is so that the Jew can connect to the teachings of Torah and mitzvahs and bring morality, inspiration, kindness and goodness to the entire world that's the privilege and obligation of a Jew to connect to Torah, to connect to Israel and illuminate the world. That will be revealed when Mashiach comes. However, says Rashi, if you insist on interpreting it with a simple interpretation, then this will be the meaning. What Rashi is telling us here is don't believe that the meaning of this verse is that first and foremost, God created heaven and earth. That's not what it means. Because first and foremost, God did not create heaven and earth. First and foremost, as he says in the next few verses, God created light. 
So why does he say, first and foremost, God created heaven and earth? The answer is he doesn't. Kach parshayu, this is the meaning. Bereish is in the beginning of Briah's creation, Shamayim Ba'aretz of heaven and earth. Be'aretz ha'isa sayu b'avayu, and the earth was unformed and void. Second verse, v'choshech, and there was darkness. Vayomer elokim yihior, so God said, let there be light, and light was the beginning of creation. This verse is not coming to instruct us that these came first. Because if that was his intention, he should have written The word Bereshis should have been replaced with Bereshina in the beginning. Because there is no usage of the word racious anywhere in the Torah that's not hyphenated and connected to the word that follows it. Kimei, for example, Breshis Mamleches Yehiyokim, Reishis Mamlachte, Reishis Degon Chorashi brings examples of Reishis being a hyphenated word. Here also it has to be sort of hyphenated. Bereshis Boro Lakim in the beginning of God's creation. Kimei Bereshis Bray in the beginning of his creation. Vedemalai, we have a similar grammatical usage. Tchilas Dibra Hashem Beishaya, Klaimer, Tchilas Dibure Shalak Kodesh Boracho Beishaya, the beginning of God's conversation with Hosea, Vayomer Hashem El Yosheya. So here also, Bereshis Boro Lakim, Vayomer El Kim Yehior. Vim Tamer, and if you'll argue and say, Lahayt is Bo, that this comes to teach. That these heaven and earth were created first. And the meaning would be in the beginning of everything. We created these. We find plenty of verses that are abridged in their language and skip a word which we have to insert on our own. Rashi brings certain examples of verses where a word is omitted. In that case, you should wonder. Because in fact, water came first. Because it already says that the Spirit of God was hovering about the water. Where was the water? In order for it to hover about the water, there has to be water. So the verse didn't tell us yet about the creation of water when it was. So from here we learn. That don't say earth and heaven were created first. Water and light were created first. Water. The heaven is created from fire and water. And we don't talk about the creation of fire. We don't talk about the creation of water. Therefore, you're forced to say that that this verse is not a verse which teaches us the order of events. It's not a chronological verse. It's an instructive verse. Boro Elikim. Why, says Rashi, do we begin creation with the name of Elokim, which connotates and suggests God's attribute of justice rather than his attribute of mercy. It doesn't say Baruch Hashem. Shabbat Chila, because in the beginning, Ola B'machshav had entered his mind to create creation with the attribute of justice. God intended, so to speak, for the world to be a law and order world. You follow the law, fine. You don't, it's over. But when he began to impose law and order, he saw that he was about to lose everyone. The world would not be able to survive on cold, calculated law and order. Therefore, he preceded the justice with compassion. Partnering compassion with justice. Suddenly we see a switch where the Torah switches a little later to both names of Hashem. For example, Biyom Asos, Hashem Elokim Eretz Vishomayim. A little later, the Torah says, on the day that Hashem Elokim created heaven and earth with Hashem, 
the world could survive because there's compassion as well. Verse 2. Bihaoretz and the earth, Haisa was tohu vavohu, unformed and void, one big mishmash, vechoshech, and there was darkness al sahim over the deep underground waters. Veruach elokim, and the Spirit of God, mirachephes, was hovering al pnei hamoyim over the water. Rashi explains this ambiguous mystical verse. Two, tohu vavohu, tohu lashen tema vishimomim. Tohu means astonishment and amazement. Sha'odam tohe umishtomim aboh shabah. A person would look at the very beginning moments of creation, so to speak, and would just find one big confusion. Tohu is estordison in Old French. Vohu lashen reikis utzdu, void, empty. Upon the face of the waters which were on the earth. Allegorically speaking, God's throne of glory was suspended in midair. And it hovered over the waters. By virtue of the breath of God's mouth, allegorically speaking. What is the breath of God's mouth? Uvima more, his utterance. The famous mission in Pirkei Avot, Ba'asoro, Ma'amoros, Nivra Olam. God created the world with ten utterances. Kiona, Hamrachepes alakein. God's utterances hovered about creation like a dove hovers about its nest. Akoverter in Old French. Verse 3. Vayomer Elohim, and God said, Yehi or, let there be light. Vayehi or, and there was light. So that was the actual first utterance of the ten utterances, is God said, let there be light. Actually, as we count the utterances, we see how many times does it say Vayomer Hashem? Not ten, but nine. And our sages say that Bereshis Nami Mamar, that the verse Bereshis is also one of the ten utterances. There's a lot to be said here, but just to segue for a moment in the teachings of Hasidus, based upon the teachings of Kabbalah, we talk about the seven days of creation, which we know as Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Shabbos. The six days of active creation and the seventh day, which is when God rested and abstained from creation, correspond to the seven attributes of Chesed, Gvura, Tiferes, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malchus. Kindness and severity and so on. The first day would be based on the attribute of kindness. Kindness represents the flow of divine energy. Severity represents the constriction, the filtering, the containment, the distribution of divine energy. So to speak, the first attribute is the male energy of flow. The second attribute is the female energy of transforming that flow into a myriad of details. So we see that the first day of creation the beginning of creation is light, which is the flow. And of course, in creation, we already talk about water, which is flow. So that the, the aspects created within each and every day mirror the attribute with which they were created, which explains why day one is unbridled light, untamed water. It's only in day two that the light takes form and shape and the water is separated because day two is the day of separation, filtering, distribution, the severity or feminine energy. Okay, verse 4. Vayar Elohim and God saw the light, Kitov, that it was good. 
and God divided between light and darkness. What does this mean? We also need the Madrashic teaching, says Rashi. Ra'ohu, because Hashem saw she'ena k'day l'shtamesh b'rishoyim, that the light of creation is too good, and the wicked are not worthy of utilizing it. V'hivdilei, so he set it apart, l'tzadikim, for the righteous, l'osid lovei, when Mashiach comes. So that there will be a messianic revelation of light, which will be otherworldly. And that is what God did on the first day of creation. It's here. It will be utilized in the world when Mashiach comes. But for now, the light has to be limited. Well, if he pshute, the simple meaning, kach parsheo, this is the meaning. Ra'o kitev, he saw it was good. And it would make no sense for light and darkness to function together in confusion. So he Established day and night, which is very perplexing, by the way. How God creates light and how he establishes day and night when the sun wasn't created yet. But that's for homework. Verse 5. With this verse, we'll finish today's class. And God called the light day. And the darkness, he called Laila night. By he era, by he boker, and it was evening, and it was morning. Yom echad, day one, and here we see that he always starts with the evening. It was evening, and it was morning. Yom echad, lefi seder, according to the order. Rashi says loshna parsha of the language of the portion. Hayulilichta, we should have written Yom Rishon, the first day. Yom echad means the one day. Kameshikosav b'shara yom, as it says, sheni shlishi to be lama kosav echad. Why one? There's another lesson. Because at this point in time, as it relates to the material creation of the material world, God was one and only. Because there were no other independent entities. Even angels were not created until the second day. Therefore, Yom Echad was still a day when God was alone without any other higher forms of creation. We'll stop here, and God willing, we'll continue throughout the week, little by little.